two years since the Tonkin Gulf incident, U.S. Navy forces in Southeast Asia have been drawn deeper and deeper into the Vietnam War. The Seventh Fleet is engaged in a mobile selective war in which versatile sea power is being effectively applied over a great distance. It is not a traditional Navy war pitting ship against ship. There is no strong opposing naval force. Extensive air and ground actions constitute a great portion of its time spent in combat. The Vietnamese terrain, the weather, and the character of the enemy have fathered new battle tactics and techniques. This film report is the first in a projected series which will explore in depth our ever-increasing commitment throughout Southeast Asia, the jobs, and the men who perform them. of men who believe in their jobs, flight deck crewmen prepare strike aircraft for missions over enemy territory. War may seem remote from the deck of this carrier, impersonal and out of sight over the horizon. Well-guarded targets in North Vietnam are but minutes of airtime away. From the beginning of our buildup in Vietnam, carrier-based air power was available, and we were ready for just this kind of operation. Although we have a nuclear attack capability in our carrier-based aviation, we also maintain a conventional capability. This jet-propelled attack aircraft and the 20-year-old Sky Raider each fulfills a particular mission in this unconventional war. Task Force 77, the striking force of the 7th Fleet in the 30 million square miles of the Western Pacific, includes ships and aircraft of various types. Each carrier with its supporting ships of TF-77 functions as a task group. Five attack carriers assigned to 7th Fleet, two operate near the mouth of the Gulf of Tonkin at Point Yankee, just north of the 17th parallel.
Standard CVA, on station at Point Dixie off Saigon in the South China Sea, provides in-country air support for U.S. and Allied ground forces in South Vietnam, support coordinated by Commander 7th Fleet and ComUS MACB. The advantages of a mobile airfield are obvious. Free from mortar and surprise guerrilla attack, the carrier is at liberty to maneuver, to select the best tactical position from which to launch and recover its aircraft. While assigned to combat duty, pilots fly day and night, seven days a week for as long as 30 days at a time. It is easy to see why more than 50% of all sorties flown against North Vietnam are launched from the Yankee Station carrier. and accurate anti-aircraft fire is often encountered. Surface-to-air missiles continue to be a threat, but effective countermeasures are being developed against them. Many leave and many return. Some do not. This pilot, downed by enemy action, will live to fight another day courtesy of a search and rescue team. It's a 24-hour workday for the search and rescue crews. Aboard a CVS, helicopter pilots and crews are briefed on the day's SAR operation. Specific search areas are assigned based upon fighter aircraft routes to and from target areas. Search and rescue, a collateral but by no means secondary task for the 7th Fleet ASW group, utilizes an array of Navy aircraft, ships, and facilities. After combat aircraft are launched for a strike, the SNR team goes into action. In order to remain airborne for the extended periods of time required by combat operations, the SNR helicopters are refueled at sea by a destroyer. The coordination and high professional skill exhibited during these exacting refueling techniques is a tribute to the competence of all hands. Aboard the CVS, search and rescue facilities are tuned to the operation in progress. A pilot is down. His position is quickly plotted. Within minutes, the freshly refueled helicopter is dispatched to the scene. Rescue is added to its life-saving score. SNR continues its mission. 
that of providing a skyhook when and wherever needed. Vietnam is ready for action. are conducted on a daily basis in the coastal and offshore waters. Forward air controllers acting as the eyes of the DD spot the targets and relay the information. In a matter of minutes, the destroyer lays down a barrage of five-inch shells. gunfire has made many coastal Viet Cong installations vulnerable, which heretofore were immune to attack because of their inaccessible location. The concept of naval gunfire support, that of a mobile gun platform capable of delivering heavy caliber fire in situations where conventional artillery could not be used, demonstrates the versatility of Pacific Fleet units. Gunfire support from destroyers and cruisers has taken a heavy toll of Viet Cong materiel, equipment, installations, and morale. radio stations, supply and ammunition dumps, and combat units, all are fair game for the DDs ranging up and down the coast. The success of our military operations against the enemy confirms once again the importance of close, sustained cooperation between the services. junks in the South China Sea. They may be carrying contraband for the Viet Cong in South Vietnam. Identification to stop infiltration by sea is a continuing project tag, Operation Market Time. Vietnamese and U.S. Navy and U.S. Coast Guard Market Time forces covering the 1,000-mile coastline are coordinated by coastal surveillance centers headquartered at Da Nang, Hue Nan, Na Trang, Bung Tao, and Phu Quoc Island. Market time forces operate from the 17th parallel south and west into the Gulf of Siam. The seaward extension a three-mile defensive sea area was established by the government of Vietnam.
The search area was further extended to the 12-mile limit for enforcing immigration and customs regulations. The intent to stop and search suspicious vessels outside the 12-mile limit was also declared. When suspicious craft are sighted, U.S. surface forces are notified. These units are made up of mine sweeps, U.S. Coast Guard cutters, radar picket escorts, and the new swift boats. Identifying junks is a problem. Motorized and larger than usual craft are prime suspects. Junks operating in government of Vietnam declared junk-free areas are always searched. Ideally, all junk should be searched, but it is a matter of simple mathematics. There are not enough forces to search every junk. Even against these odds, market time forces stop and search an average of 250 junks a day. Navy liaison officer aboard each U.S. unit checks all papers and cargo manifests and does the inspecting. After a transition period, Control of market time operations passed from 7th Fleet to Chief Naval Advisory Group, U.S. MACV, now COMNAV-4V, to facilitate closer coordination with the Vietnamese Sea and Coastal Forces. It would be blatant speculation to infer that market time operations had stopped sea infiltration. But we do know that it has hurt the Viet Cong and forced him to become reckless and even desperate as seen in recent gun running incidents. Just southeast of Saigon is an area known as Rung Sat the evil place. It is a maze of dense mangrove swamps where roads are virtually non-existent and the sampan is the mode of transportation. For years, the Viet Cong have used Rong San as a sanctuary with little fear of detection. Most of the area is uninhabited. The dense jungle canopy provides excellent coverage for munitions factories, hospitals, troop areas, and is a strategic staging area for operations in the capital tactical zone. Rong Sot is also of strategic importance to government of Vietnam's and the U.S. forces' war effort. The Long Tao River, Saigon's lifeline to the sea, lies entirely within Rong Sot. During March of 1966, the Viet Cong executed three attacks on commercial shipping in the Long Tao in an attempt to block the flow of cargo to Saigon. In late March, the Special Landing Force, 7th Fleet Amphibious Force, 
launched a full-scale vertical and over-the-beach assault on the Long Thon Peninsula at the seaward end of Rung Sot. The initial assault was launched by surface craft in the early morning. Their objective was near Dong Hua at the western end of the peninsula. They were quickly followed by helicopter assault near Kanjio at the eastern end. A third marine landing force was standing by on the Princeton while the destroyer Robison, marine rocket helos from the Princeton, and aircraft from the Hancock softened up the beach midway between the other two landing areas. This unit was landed about two hours after the initial assault. The first waves met no opposition. For 12 days, the Marines probed deeper into Rung Sat on search and destroy missions. Ground contact with the enemy was minimal. Jack's day was unique in many ways for amphibious marine operations in Vietnam in that in-country U.S. and government of Vietnam forces worked in close coordination with 7th Fleet units. U.S. Air Force B-52s conducted raids in the northern sector of Rung Sot and Army Helos operated from the decks of Bell Grove, LSD-2. The Vietnamese Navy River Assault Groups and U.S. Navy and U.S. Coast Guard patrol boats performed blocking operations on the numerous waterways to prevent exfiltration by the Viet Cong and kept the Marines replenished with fresh water and supply. They also kept the rivers clear of civilian sampan traffic. Even though the government of Vietnam had ordered the area cleared and designated the rivers off limits to the population, some persisted. They were picked up for their own safety as well as a safeguard against the Viet Cong's impressing them into service. The key to the accomplishment of Jack Day's objective was the destruction of a massive Viet Cong complex just east of the Bom Sot River in the northwest sector a large hospital area of more than 25 buildings, a mine factory, and training complex. Jack's day is considered highly successful. It was the first attack in force on the Rung Sot and was a definite move in neutralizing the Viet Cong's capability to harass shipping. The idea of a full-scale attack on Rung Sot had been the object of much discussion, but the seeming impregnability of the area always made the task appear impossible. Through tactical resolution and a maximum employment of forces in a closely coordinated effort, the amphibious marine team downgraded the problem to difficult. <laughs>